And welcome everyone to uh, this uh, lecture in our Delta on the Move lecture series here at the Hong Kong Institute uh, for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, my name is Ghassan Moazin and I'm an assistant professor here um, at uh, the Institute. So um, as the name already says, the Delta on the Move lecture series is part of our of a new project we have here at the Institute called Delta on the Move, uh, which is on the historical development of the, um, uh, of the Greater Bay Area since roughly um, 1700. And we're sort of trying to bring together researchers that work on the region um, uh, in this lecture series. Um, today, we're very happy to welcome to the Institute and to the lecture series, um, Dr. Nicholas Wong, um, who is an assistant professor in the School of Chinese here at uh, the University of Hong Kong. Um, he received his PhD in comparative literature from the uni University of Chicago. And uh, before starting his current position, actually uh, was a fellow at the Society of Fellows um, at HKU. And, and we're very glad and thankful that he is going to present some of his new research here um, today. His talk is titled uh, Mining Concessions and Customary Law in Malaya, Sarawak and Patani on the Chinese question after the 1880s. Um, before I hand things over um, to Dr. Wong, I should mention that um, the format is, uh, is hybrid. So that means um, we have people both online and in person here uh, in the audience. Um, Dr. Wong is going to speak for roughly 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. If you're here with us in uh, at May Hall, then please just raise your hand and, and ask your question as usual. If you're in the online audience, then please submit um, your questions through the Q&A button uh, in Zoom, and then I will read them out during the Q&A. Um, but Nicholas, if you are ready, please feel free to, uh, to get started. All right. Thank you, uh, Ghassan. Uh, I would like to also thank Angela, uh, John, Helen, uh, for this chance to present my research on extractive capitalism and Southeast Asian Chinese writing. Uh, a few months ago, I went to the Hong Kong U Library, uh, the Deacon's Archive, and I found a paper trail about a company formed in Hong Kong uh, to raise capital uh, to prospect for tin in Perak. So it's a story of how uh, the Perak Tin Mining Company, owned by a Shanghai barrister by the name of William uh, Drummond, uh, became the Salama Tin Mining Syndicate in the 1880s. So I looked through letters, um, settlement deeds, liquidation agreements, sale agreements, land surveys, uh, share and bond certificates, and found uh, this job letter that I found quite intriguing. Uh, so this is a letter from P.M. Betcher to W.V. Drummond, Esquire. Having been employed for the last six years directly and indirectly by the Borneo Company Limited in mining and engineering and metallurgical management of various mines in Sarawak and Patani countries, I have no hesitation in offering my services for so similar an undertaking uh, with the assurance that my experience in the geology of these parts, namely the Malaya, uh, the local methods necessary for conducting such operations and controlling native labor together with a thorough knowledge of the Malay language may be of considerable advantage to you. Okay, so Betcher uh, did not include supplementary material. There was no writing sample, teaching statement, or any equivalent that you expect from a job application, but of course, right? Uh, in case a reference letter is needed, he wrote down a name. So who is this job applicant, uh, Betcher? Uh, Betcher was a fellow and associate at the Royal School of Mines, uh, German Street, London, at the time of application. And also, who is Drummond? Uh, I couldn't find a photo, but uh, here's a photo of Drummond's house on the right instead of his portrait. Uh, obviously, houses indicate wealth. So you can see his standing in Shanghai is, is really uh, strong, right? He owned a sugar, uh, rubber companies, and he decided to set up a tin mining company in uh, Perak this time. Okay, on the, on the far uh, bottom right, you see a logo of the Borneo company, uh, and they have branches in Malaya, Sarawak, and Patani. And what kinds of commodities did they trade in? Uh, they were known for pioneering uh, the teak industry in Thailand, and they had uh, strong trading interests across Borneo, Java, Singapore. So their reach was uh, uh, very extensive. Uh, so the company that's being set up cannot compare to uh, Borneo Company. Here's a map of the region um, from 1901. So Malaya and Sarawak are marked out in pink. Uh, so is British North Borneo or Sabah, uh, as well as Brunei. 
So Sarawak uh, on the right was ruled by the Brooks, who also called themselves the white, uh, who called themselves Rajas or kings in Malay. Uh, Sarawak was never formally colonized until after World War II. And you see marked out in green uh, as British sphere of influence, uh, although Bangkok exercised its claims over it, is uh, Patani. Uh, Patani is a Malay Muslim port region that was uh, formerly, uh, that formerly became Southern Thailand or part of it. Uh, you see Kelantan and Kedah, that is also now part of Malaysia. So uh, Malaya, Sarawak, and Patani may indicate the success story of a, uh, an extractive multinational uh, like the Borneo Company, having branches in many places. Uh, but it's also a heuristic for me uh, to think about the links between formal and informal empire and its spatialization of labor, land, and capital. I'm also interested in writing uh, literary history as history was lived. Uh, that is against a national mode. Okay, next, you will see a map of the colonial uh, uh, strait settlements, which included Penang, Malacca, and Singapore. Uh, the strait settlements uh, was established in 1826, uh, and it was under the British East India Company's control. Uh, after it disbanded, it became part of British India in the 1860s, uh, but soon under uh, direct British control from London, and this happened in uh, 1867. So from the viewpoint of colonialism, you get to see the other parts that were gradually colonized on the uh, Malay Peninsula, such as Perak, right? So this is Perak. And uh, Penang is here. Uh, Province Wellesley is attached to it. You also have Malacca, which is around here on the peninsula, Singapore. And then Labuan is uh, also another British uh, territory. Okay, so did Betcher get the job in the end? It is unclear. Uh, there is no record of uh, Drummond uh, replying to him. Uh, in the archives, I saw contracts for uh, mining engineers from Cornwall and Devonshire. Uh, so the question to you is, would you have hired Becker or Betcher? He spoke the local language. He knew how to control native labor. Uh, but the question is, how do you control native or migrant labor? In the next 40 minutes, um, you find out about the situation in the 1880s, which was when uh, colonial British rule was consolidated on the Malay Peninsula. It was also the time of um, intense investments, the tin rush uh, on the Chinese, uh, starting from the 1880, 1884, uh, brought many economic changes to Perak. Right, so um, I'll start with the materials I found in the Deacon's archive. Uh, to talk about business interests, and then I'll go on to talk about colonial British uh, scholar administrators, um, and then move on to Qing Chinese uh, poet diplomats who were their contemporaries, and they worked a lot with each other, uh, with the British. Uh, I would also introduce some indigenous uh, viewpoints. So Mandaling, uh, they, they were sort of, uh, uh, they, they moved from Sumatra, uh, to Perak and establish themselves, uh, and Malay Pawang. And Pawang is shaman or, uh, or miracle, doc, miracle workers who uh, uh, were able to look for tin and help the Chinese do that. Okay, so the first part will be about mining concessions, and then the second part will be about customary law. Um, and I, I framed it as the Chinese question. Right. Uh, the Chinese question is in the title of uh, two recent books, one by Ming Ai uh, about the gold rush in California and how different continents uh, formulated this Chinese question. Uh, second, uh, there's a book by Carolyn Howe on Filipino Chinese. Uh, we can also get at this Chinese question from the angle of xenophobia. Uh, this book by Chester Holcombs, uh, The Real Chinese Question in 1901, uh, and it's related to his campaigning. Uh, against the Chinese Exclusion Act in the US, uh, 1882. Uh, Ch uh, Chinese question, I, I think about Hannah Arendt and how she writes about the Jewish question uh, in relation to imperialism, uh, states and global capital. Uh, but I admit it's, it's quite strange to pose the question of the Chinese question. But um, looking back, the colonial British administrators asked this question in Southeast Asia. 
uh, they asked, what is Chinese? And this question was bound up with how they define customs uh, legally and in vernacular terms across the divide. Uh, extractive capitalism is also part of the picture. Sorry. Uh, colonial administrators uh, translated ancient texts about uh, religions, manners, customs from China, Indian and, uh, India and Malaya and elsewhere uh, to figure out indigenous concepts of land tenure, uh, among other things. And uh, this facilitated, facilitated the expansion of uh, commercial agriculture and mining. Uh, writing the literary history of the region, I'm interested in how uh, extraction is linked to the emergence of Chinese writing uh, and how to think about modern Chinese writing as a minority question. So, you know, my, my end goal is literary history. And I noticed from the uh, uh, scholarship that it tends to be about Nansia or southern bound Chinese writers uh, who came from China to Malaya and Singapore because of exile. And then they were able to write in Chinese because they had the means and capabilities to do so and other people who are laborers did not right uh, so this is the canonical this is the traditional way of telling the story um but you know it, it tends to focus on capital and labor right uh you have the memoirs by self-made capitalists that tend to be self-congratulatory uh, then you have uh, the part of the labor which is anti-colonial fiction uh, NGOs or diplomatic advocacy for uh, uh, against labor exploitation. Uh, so this reflects an original racial or racialized split in the in the colony, right? Uh, migrants who own capital and provide labor versus the indigenous who own land, and they are expected to work in agriculture. Uh, but following uh, some anthropologists uh, and, and geographers, Fernando Coronel, as well as Henri uh, Lefebvre. Um, who proposed to study land as uh, a commodification in relation to uh, labor and capital. So uh, when, when Marxist theory emphasizes uh, labor and capital relation, uh, we, 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 they remember that Marx uh, thinks about the three terms together, right? Land is also part of the question. Uh, furthermore, um, land arguments uh, are previously linked to a romantic ideas about landscape, right? Uh, when Nansia writers uh, describe Malay and Singapore, they were like, oh, the durian, the intense smell of the durian and the beautiful jungle. It's, it's um, uh, so critics tend to focus on the language used here and criticize them for that kind of racialization using landscape. Uh, but what if we focus on land laws and customs, right? Um, and, and this is a, an issue that comes up during uh, the 1950s when uh, squatters or, or villages, uh, Chinese, were alienated from their own land. Uh, uh, but, but this is not discussed in, in terms of a long trajectory stretching back 100 years, right? Okay, so uh, the second part is uh, law and customs. Uh, I, I want to get at the different understanding of what is Chinese. Uh, we define Chinese as nationality, ethnicity, uh, uh, lang language, um, but uh, is, is there another way to think about Chinese, right? Uh, I think the British colonial uh, archive allows me to expand on this question of customary law um, that points in a different direction for uh, the history of Nanyang literature. Uh, there's a reason for obscurity, right? That in this anti-colonial moment, we don't want to think about the use of colonial archives, right? Uh, but as David Wang, uh, the way he, he proposes that it is also useful to look at missionary writings in Southeast Asia as an origins for Sinology uh, in the region. And, and so uh, it's not just uh, Chinese writing from one perspective, but uh, the, the missionary and colonial ones as well. Okay, so this uh, a long uh, attempt to introduce uh, uh, some of my concerns, how uh, capitalism, land, uh, are connected to uh, writing. Okay, so let's uh, move on to business uh, men from Shanghai and Hong Kong, right? The, 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 the talk uh, starts off with, with this. And uh, this region of uh, England, right, Cornwall and Devon, uh, there was a flow of Cornish mining interest to Asia. We think about Scottish entrepreneurs, 
uh, leaving the country, going to Japan and invest, but we also have this region, Cornwall and Devon, uh, Devon, uh, that uh, uh, experienced uh, a decline in tin mining during the 1850s. And so a lot of the savings, uh, the people move overseas to mining concerns in Malaya and elsewhere. Okay, so what are the links between London, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Malaya? Uh, when you look at the London Commodities Exchange in 1888, the price of tin from the Strait Sediments was so high. And uh, it was a time of great riches. Uh, people were being offered lots of land uh, to open tin mines. Uh, and, and so you think of, uh, of the Lon London being the arbiter, right? The, the, the sentiment, the temperature of where, where things are moving. And then you have people raising capital in Shanghai uh, and then registering their company in Hong Kong. Uh, incidentally, the Companies uh, Ordinances Act was passed in 1865. So uh, companies can register locally in Hong Kong after that year. Uh, so you, there's also the uh, compradors, my pan. Uh, so people who are local, who can speak Chinese, they were uh, intermediaries with foreign companies, right? They, they engaged these uh, interests and, and the capital moved to Malaya and Southeast Asia. So this is a, a note uh, or letter I found from the Deacon's Archive by the acting British resident. Uh, uh, preacher, um, and, and at this point it was Frank Swedenham, but he was not available, right? Uh, so this, this letter formalizes the uh, formation of the Hong Kong company uh, that uh, was formed to raise capital and uh, prospect for tin in this place called Salama. So the Perak Tin Mining and Spelting Company was liquidated. It, it was dissolved in order for uh, uh, this new company to be formed. Um, so, very formal writing. Uh, what I found interesting was this chop, the company chop here, uh, written in Chinese, uh, the Perak Tin Mining and Smelting Company, and the words Ba La Guo Wen, right? Uh, I don't know what Ba La means, but it sounds like uh, Perak and how they render it in uh, Chinese. Uh, so, this was the company stem, the seal, the seal that they use. Uh, but when the Salama Company was set up, uh, they, they just use a, a quite a regular uh, uh, picture of a, a cross shovel and a pickaxe against a bucket on the ground. So you, when you Google mining logos, you tend to see uh, these as well. So the disappearance of Chinese writing, right, uh, when they, they found the, the company. Okay, where is Salama? So um, this is a map of the western uh, 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 shores of uh, the Malayan Peninsula. You have Penang. Island, and then you see you know, Ipoh, some of you are familiar, but Salama is this red triangle located on the map. Uh, you see Taiping, which was uh, known as Larut uh, in history, and, and you note the distance from the Strait Sediments, right? It, uh, Taiping or Salama was quite close to Penang and also uh, Malacca. Uh, so um, William Maxwell, uh, whom I'll introduce later, writes an essay about uh, uh, his travel on foot to Patani to catch uh, those responsible for the assassination of the first uh, resident of Para, James Birch. Uh, he was speared by uh, 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 Malay uh, people when he was taking a shower. I think that's the story, right? Uh, that we learn in history books in, in Singapore. Uh, so William Maxwell was tasked to chase after these uh, people and catch them. And he, he writes about Patani uh, and the landscape and the tin mining that has been going on between Chinese and Malays. And there's a lot of description he writes with such flair uh, and, and uh, uh, close up, right? But I won't uh, go into detail uh, here. So, okay, more um, uh, archival material, right? Uh, about this Salama Tin Mining Company. Uh, you see beautiful cursive handwriting that I tried to replicate here on the screen um, because I, I cannot take photos of the archive. So this is the closest uh, 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 way to look at it, right? Um, they use uh, um, un underlining and also cursive handwriting. Uh, the scribes at the colonial offices as well as at the solicitor's office in Hong Kong 
uh, when they write 19th century formal documents, they don't believe in punctuation. So I, I think there's, there's nary a comma to be seen, right? Um, so uh, when they want to write their names, they write in capital letters as if they are shouting their names out in, in excitement about having a name on paper, right, perhaps. But so this, this is just the start of a, 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 an agreement uh, a between uh, the, the liquidation of the company, of the Perak company, and uh, becoming Salama Tin Mining. And you see actors like William Drummond, uh, but here you also see the Raja Muda Yusuf uh, region of the state of Perak. So uh, a Malay ruler who uh, leases out the land to uh, this company. Okay, what was the fate of Salama Tin Mining Company? What happened to it? You know, as happens to many business venture, the company folded after a few years in uh, 1893. And this was a time of intense uh, development in mining and smelting technologies. So the story is that Chinese mining techniques were quickly uh, superseded by British technologies in the early 20th century, uh, you, something called the tin dredge, where uh, if you look at a photo of it, it's something like a floating factory, a monster that scoops up buckets of tin deposits and, and moves in the water. And so it creates this uh, water mass as it, as it digs for tin, right? Uh, so extractive uh, multinationals uh, from Australia, fr um, from France, Scotland, uh, they came into the picture. So this was not just a British uh, thing, right? They were fighting against earlier actors like Chinese, uh, Siamese, so Thai, uh, Malay, as well as Mandaling uh, people. So this is um, a historian's description of, uh, of the intense competition, right? The company closed shop in 1893, uh, despite its use of a new technology called non-alluvial uh, tin mining. Okay, this is part of the larger story of uh, British business in Asia since the 1860s, which takes different forms, right? Uh, I won't go into the long history of agency houses, so finding uh, uh, sort of local companies to take care of their, the larger companies outside, uh, your trading and shipping companies. I mentioned extractive uh, multinationals. There's also overseas banks. And uh, in this letter, you find that uh, the British were also involved in the coolie trade. So they were uh, trading laborers, buying and selling uh, men for work, okay? So this letter is written by Hugh Lowe, uh, the fourth resident of Pera, who uh, was interested in commercial agriculture. And he addresses his dear Drummond, right? He says that I have uh, approved your concession, uh, but beware of the Chinese who uh, might have different ideas about labor, right? The management of labor. Uh, but don't worry about it. We have our own Chinese that we can hire every year, 10,000. Uh, and uh, if Mr. Tong Keng Singh uh, were to visit us and do business, then uh, that's a good thing. So who is uh, Mr. Tong Keng Singh here, right? He is um, uh, one of the founders of the Kaiping Mines in Zhili, uh, China. And so he, he's known as a comprador, right? Uh, being able to layers between different interests uh, locally as well as uh, British. Okay, so what made such business ventures in Malaya possible? Uh, you know, there was such a thing called the British resident system, right? Uh, the colonization happened in a certain way. So uh, the British resident would appoint advisors to the Malay locals and, and, and uh, uh, maybe their sovereignty was limited to, uh, to certain aspects such as customs, right? So uh, this uh, resident system in Pera and its connection to the Strait Sediments was uh, an important thing, right? Uh, we know that the Strait Sediments already uh, happened after 1784, right? Uh, or 86, and, and here, it's the gradual colonization of the Malay uh, Peninsula. Uh, so it uh, was uh, tense fighting between Chinese miners uh, that were backed up by uh, claims of the Sultan who wants to uh, uh, become king 
uh, so the British intervened and uh, uh, said, let, let us do the job for you, right? Let us appoint a British resident. And that would uh, settle several things, right? The business interests would be happy. Uh, tin miners would uh, be happy and business can grow. Uh, the, the boundaries between uh, the straight settlements and the, the rest of Malaya would also be clearer, right? Uh, and, and so uh, this is Frank Swedenham, the uh, uh, resident general of, of this area. This is his own words about the rationale of what he's, he's doing, okay? All right, so uh, besides uh, you know, formal systems, we have something called the Chinese protectorate on the labor side, right? When you want to take care of uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, labor contracts. Uh, so there's something called the Chinese protectorate that was set up uh, because of uh, a rule in 1877. Uh, this historian uh, says that there, uh, there is uh, a, a few uh, administrators who examined the, the contracts themselves, right? So they have to have a face-to-face -face interview to ask them whether they are willing to work in uh, British Malaya. So they took the ship from maybe Futian uh, coming via Hong Kong to Malaya, you know, Penang or Singapore. And then they were interviewed saying, yes, I, I allow myself to be worked as a laborer for how uh, such and such a time, right? So this, this protector, protector of Chinese oversaw the contracts and uh, conditions of, of laborers. Okay, um, we can move to colonial British uh, administrators. Uh, uh, what I'm interested in, how uh, British justified uh, colonialism, right? They, they did it by uh, looking at ancient texts or debates about land and customs, right? So they were interested in reading uh, things related to religion, customs, and manners. Um, but the problem is uh, they read these texts, uh, but they quite quickly tried to assimilate it to English law, uh, English legal technicalities, right? So William Maxwell, who is uh, working for the Strait Settlements, he was confused and shocked that this was happening, right? They didn't study uh, indigenous ideas of land, uh, as, as clearly as possible before they tried to introduce English law. Okay, so uh, English law in uh, the Strait Settlements uh, uh, was passed in the Royal Charter of Justice in 1826. So by the time of his writing, it already existed, right? It, but it was applied only indirectly in uh, the Malay states outside these Strait Settlements and in, uh, as well in Sarawak. Um, so um, it's direct application, but uh, statutory arrangement only happened early in the 20th century, right? So uh, there's this idea where you, it doesn't have to be written out as law, but it, 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 it is already happening because of proximity to the straight settlements. Okay, so why is this? person, William Maxwell, important. I, I don't show photos, but I, I, I hope the name sticks with you, right? Um, he is known for introducing the torrent system uh, from Australia when he did some uh, you know, field work and research, um, which means that you only need to uh, register titles to land for it, for it to be valid, right? So this was a quick way to uh, maybe uh, make land uh, uh, part of the hands of the British, right? Uh, but there was also studying of the Adat, which is a Malay for customary law, uh, uh, try to synthesize it with ideas of Islamic law uh, uh, before uh, uh, that was happening. So um, William Maxwell, um, his legacy is that this, this idea of the torrent system became the national land code in Malaysia, right, uh, after, after World War II. Um, so th some scholars read this as, okay, uh, this is a sign of exploitation, right? Uh, that you define law in order for land grabbing to happen. Uh, but other scholars see it as a process of rationalization, right? To make the, si the system uh, more efficient and uh, simple, right? Uh, uh, people like J.M. who is uh, also a British uh, Orientalist or... or, or, or uh, study of Malay customs, he 
saw that you know in these um, ideas of, of, of discussing, there is some provision given for uh, customary small holdings uh, that became statute. So there's some kind of protection for minority ideas of land that became uh, formal codes, right? Uh, but but this is uh, the idea of, of the Torrin system. Okay, let's take a breath and move on to maybe from the Malay to the Chinese side of things, right? So this guy, um, GT Hare, known as the protector of Chinese in uh, the Strait Settlements, uh, wrote a textbook about um, this issue of Chinese customs, right? So published in uh, Singapore in 1894, uh, GT Hare's textbook was used to train colonial officers uh, to deal with a new kind of Chinese person, uh, unlike the ones that they are familiar with in London or China. Uh, the Chinese character San Zhou Fu uh, on the cover page refers to the ports of Singapore, Penang, and Malacca, known together as the Strait Settlements. And so here, the textbook uh, was written in, all in classical Chinese. Uh, and this was a way of teaching business Chinese to uh, British uh, colonial officers. Right? So you look at the table of contents here. Uh, it included a variety of documents from uh, edicts, uh, by the Chinese government, local news, business contracts, disputes, petitions, proclamations. Uh, but if uh, business Chinese textbooks look like that today, I, I think your students would cry and uh, complain to you, right? Well, but maybe you should try <laughs> bring this into class one day. Uh, what I found striking is the use of the phrase documentary Chinese, right? Uh, it refers to uh, newly arrived, uh, new arrivals from China, as well as the older generations of uh, Straits Chinese. Uh, other academics uh, who, who lived in uh, Malaya this time also wrote about uh, the customs of Chinese. So he was not the only one, right? Uh, but the, the phrase documentary Chinese is intriguing, right? It suggests maybe uh, Chinese can be documented or studied by the British but it also suggests that Chinese themselves were producing documents to be studied, right? So there's, uh, it's not just one side having the agency, okay? So uh, this is a page from the textbook. Uh, it is a text about prostitution and uh, venereal disease. Uh, and if you can see, a good student marked up one of the characters and said it, it, there was a mistake in it, right? Tian Gui. Gan guai, right? Uh, the guai, uh, like jiu, yan jiu de jiu, right? Becomes a different character, right? So what is this gan guai, right? It, it is something like scoundrel, villain, or traitor. So the, the, the student was able to uh, amend this uh, uh, mistake here. Um, so other, other documents are not so racy in, in the uh, textbook. Uh, you see official documents by uh, Huang Junxian, right? Uh, who, who was a, a diplomat. Uh, so th there were different viewpoints uh, by the Chinese government for the treatment of Chinese overseas. So there was official uh, uh, statements, but also the popular sentiments being represented. Right? Uh, I won't go into so much detail, but there are uh, more examples of uh, uh, people being exploited and then uh, people uh, petitioning for money to be returned to them. So very nitty gritty day-to-day uh, -day things about uh, uh, money that are being discussed. Okay, so this suggests to me that uh, Chinese writing can be seen as part of a larger uh, cosmopolitan uh, juridical culture, right? Uh, of, of 19th century Britain uh, and its governance in the Malay world. Uh, so why do we care about textbooks? Yeah, we care about textbooks because uh, English law, when they try to define Chinese customs, they look at things like the Li Zi, right? The Book of Rights, the Edicts, uh, to figure out what the Chinese thought, right? So that was their way of uh, figuring, out, figuring out common law and uh, uh, deriving a system to govern Chinese subjects, right? So it was quite different from what the Chinese saw overseas Chinese at that time, right? They saw them as people who just out loving the motherland. And there was the, the ban against coming back, right? Uh, that was lifted only in 1893. 
So you can imagine that uh, people uh, who left didn't really want to come back or came back through the back door, right? Illegal means. Okay, so what does uh, Ambi Hooker, who is uh, uh, a very good legal uh, historian of Southeast Asia and uh, uh, Chinese uh, Hindu as well as is Islamic law, uh, he says that, you know, as I mentioned, books uh, were the evidence of Chinese custom for the British. Okay. Additionally, uh, the textbook was a manual for administration, right? Uh, but it also became something like a founding for the legal framework, right, to govern Malaya. Um, quite interestingly, he says that okay, there's a difference between the French and the British uh, colonial system, right? Uh, uh, when the French defined legal subjects, it was about citizens and subjects and everywhere, everyone in between, right? the assimilated Asians. Whereas for the British, they categorize it as race and religion uh, quite differently. And I, I think this has quite important implications for how uh, writing is being studied today. Okay, there is another textbook that um, G.T. Hare uh, compiled, which is called the Hokkien uh, Vernacular, right? Uh, this time it's uh, for British colonial administrators to learn Hokkien and communicate with their subject population. So this is on the right, and then you see the English version on the left, which I think is the cheat sheet version, right? The translation for students who cannot do, do the exercises properly. So why is uh, Hokkien a vernacular, right? I, I, uh, I must check, but the Chinese title of the textbook is something like Fujian Tu Yu, right? A local dialect of Patua or, or Fang Yan, which is uh, translated as regional language. Um, but vernacular also um, goes back to this idea that the textbook use a romanization scheme uh, uh, devised by missionaries in the 19th century known as the Peiweiji uh, or church romanization. Peiweiji uh, is Bai Hua Zi, right? Uh, so Bai Hua Zi is vernacular writing, uh, writing written characters to represent uh, spoken language, right? So I, I don't show you the Peiweiji, but you can just imagine that it's some kind of multilingual learning of, of the language. Okay, so here is a lesson uh, 99. Uh, this is a dialogue between uh, Mr. Pitt and Mr. To that took place in the Strait Sediments. Uh, Mr. To is a Chinese laborer from Xiamen or Amoy, and he worked in a Dutch um, tobacco plantation in Delhi, Sumatra. Uh, he stopped by the Strait Sediments, and then he was going back to China via Hong Kong. He didn't get rich as planned uh, because he gambled all his money. Uh, in paragraph six, um, here. He mentions the protector of Chinese in Singapore, uh, right? So the British colonial government uh, who witnessed the signing of his contract with his employer. But then when he's in Sumatra, there's a different story about exploitation uh, by the rapacious Dutch and Chinese foremen. And he succumbed to his temptations of gambling, opium, prostitution, etc. Right. And uh, in paragraph 15, you see that uh, this Dialogue says uh, that the, the system in the Dutch colonies is very bad, right? So uh, the gambling dens are a short-sighted policy on the part of the foreman uh, to control Chinese labor, right? So this is maybe a, an alibi or a, uh, an excuse for a British uh, uh, protection of Chinese, right? So here you have legal uh, justification uh, presented as a pedagogical tool of language learning, right? Uh, so law is from the people, but also for the people's consumption, right? These are uh, manuals and textbooks that uh, teach people about law in a vernacular way, right? But we can also study this uh, against the grain. What do I mean? Um, there, there is a different kind of uh, idea of the Chinese language or dialect, right? Uh, different from uh, Nansia writers, so uh, the Chinese elite intellectuals that who came and observed Malaya, who wrote in Guoyu, right? Uh, Chinese uh, who were influenced by Republican May Fourth styles and argumentations and 
uh, affiliations and politics. So this is a different uh, viewpoint, right, from that uh, during the same time. Okay, so here's the cover page. Um, and uh, G.D. Hare also acknowledges that he borrowed some of the uh, uh, written exercises from this uh, textbook, right, written by Thomas Francis Wade in Shanghai. Uh, so they were teaching Mandarin, Pekingese, and this is model, the Hokkien textbook is modeled after this uh, version, right? Uh, they just removed some parts and added uh, local color, local interest. Okay. Um, Let's move on to uh, the Qing government and their response to uh, this whole situation about uh, British governance, right? So when was the Qing uh, consulate set up? Uh, in 1877, uh, about six months after the British set up the Chinese uh, uh, protectorate. Um, but the idea is that um, the Qing government already had uh, ideas to set up something like this, but the Straits Settlements uh, government beat them to it. Uh, so we can talk about this in terms of a rivalry between uh, British and Chinese uh, politics over the Straits Chinese, right, around several issues. And when uh, the Qing government entered the picture, it was usually a discussion of profits from opium trade, right, uh, about the tax farming, how much money can be gained, and are the Chinese also eating into these profits, right? So you have William Maxwell attacking Huang Chunxian. Uh, the Council General in Singapore at this point of time about opium tax, you have G.T. Hare, so, whom I mentioned, also intervening in a, a tax farm about opium. Okay, and this is uh, documented by Diana Kim in her uh, recent book. Uh, but the main point about this is uh, the Chinese question, right? Uh, uh, the legality of straight Chinese debates, uh, uh, the legality of straight Chinese goes back to debates about custom. Right, but from the Chinese viewpoint, do they even think about Chinese? Right? How do they think about it? I think back then they had ideas like uh, Fan and Tang, right? Self versus the other, right? Tang Ren, Hong Yan versus Fan, who's people who have left overseas. So how do you translate Chinese or back translate Chinese in this sense? Okay, so I would use uh, Huang Chunxian's classical poem to illustrate this point, right? He uses uh, this word Fan here. Uh, I mentioned he was a council general in Singapore for three years, uh, from 1891 to 94. And he wrote a poem about Chinese laborers in Nanyang. Nanyang is uh, South Seas, so uh, Malaya and Singapore. Uh, so he uh, writes, uh, I can read it out in Cantonese for a bit. Chang Yao, Ho Lan Hak, Kwai Kwai Pak Long, Pak, Tam Tam Fu Si Zhe. Yeah? Right, so you, you hear this um, sounds, right? That the rhyming sounds like in Cantonese. Uh, you will know that uh, Huang Sun Xian is from uh, Mei Xian Guangdong, right? Of Hakka descent. So do I read this poem out in uh, Cantonese or Hakka? Uh, and you can figure out how, how it sounds like, but maybe not in Mandarin because the rhymes don't work. Uh, so this is a story about a poem about a Chinese who worked in the Dutch East Indies. He earned some money. Uh, people know this. He was falsely accused of uh, con cavorting with the enemy, Tong Fan, right? So this is a straightforward story or a setup for his argument, right? So one of uh, 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 Huang Chunxian's accomplishments as a diplomat is to uh, successfully petitioned the Qing government to lift the ban on returning Chinese in 1893. So this is uh, basically the argument against the ban right? in his poem. Uh, I would suggest that Tong Fan and Guo Fan uh, sounds familiar, right? Guo Fan working overseas um, has connotations of national betrayal, right? But who actually is the chief culprit? who is the chief culprit from this perspective, if not he himself, right? So it, it is the law that is the culprit, right? That, that he, he decides. Um, so here I'm not suggesting that 
uh, Huang Chunxian uh, is writing poetry to figure out what is straight Chinese, while the British wrote uh, textbooks and legal uh, documents. Uh, but maybe poetry belongs to a wider world of uh, diplomatic correspondence uh, in Chinese, which is uh, public facing, it communicates and it makes meanings. It is part of the written gen genres of uh, edicts, memorials that are worth examining. But then here you have the classical Chinese distinction, right? The elite versus the uh, vernacular, the written versus the oral, right? Um, so here is the not elite version, the vernacular version of uh, the story, right? Uh, so it's um, Hokkien and uh, Hakka songs about uh, leaving home to work in the Nanyang. And it uh, talks about bitter exploitation. Uh, you would ask, you know, what is the difference with Huang Chunxian's poem? Uh, and I can tell you Huang Chunxian also collected these Hakka songs. Um, so he was interested in them, right? But he maybe made it sound better in his... Uh, in his uh, scholarly ways, make, give them an argument. Uh, here, you have the Dutch sinologist uh, Will Idema, who translates Han as barbarian. So I looked through the translation of some Kejia uh, Shanke, right, uh, Hakka mountain songs and Guo and um, this translation of Han as barbarian recalls Lydia Liu's uh, uh, reading of colonial British interpretation of the word, right? They she says that they, they overread it uh, as barbarian, which constitutes an injury and therefore backs a response. Right? So here, Fan, or Will Idema, refers to indigenous Malays uh, or anyone who is not Chinese. Um, so Idema makes this word as injurious as possible in his translations. Uh, in other parts, he also includes certain racial slurs and bad words. Right? So uh, this. Uh, Interestingly, uh, Kuo Fanke has uh, similar themes to G.T. Her Hare's textbook, uh, The Hokkien Vernacular. Uh, it, uh, it warns you against uh, drinking, uh, smoking opium, gambling, prostitution. Uh, but it is ultimately about going back to the motherland, right? Um, but it's strange given that uh, uh, returning home was illegal at, the, at that point. Um, but here, I would also like to point out another difference uh, is that in Hokkien, uh, uh, maybe G.T. Hare's textbook pays attention to written forms of Hokkien, right? To learn the syntax, the vocabulary as a perfect written form. Uh, it pretends to speak like a Hokkien speaker about hardship using the conversation and dialogues. But here you have Kuo Fan Ge as a poetic oral form uh, talking about hardship, right? What Lisa Yun calls uh, poeticized testimonies. Uh, so they, these were later uh, transcribed into writing. Um, so uh, the, the more ironic thing is that uh, nowadays, modern Hokkien sounds like examples from uh, G.D. Hess textbook, uh, rather than these Kuo Fan Ge or Shan Ge, right? Because these are classical uh, sounding poems. How much time do I have? Okay, so um, I would like to frame uh, the Chinese question thus uh, by viewing uh, Chinese language writing produced by colonial administrators as part of the literary history of uh, Malaya, uh, because their viewpoints on customs is particularly valuable. How? Okay, so customs uh, becomes customary law for the British. Uh, they define uh, legal precedent statutes. Whereas in the Qing, right, the word for customs or customary law, if you think of the word su, right, joke, right, su in all its meanings of popular, debased, vulgar, uh, customary, vernacular, uh, and even this carries into notions of tang versus fan, right, self versus the other. And I think that this has a, a, an implication for the legal and political subject. Right, uh, that the British created Chinese personal law to understand the Straits Chinese. Uh, so they used Chinese books on customs from China, uh, and then they modified it to local conditions. Uh, 
but then there's a situation that uh, maybe the Chinese from China were seeing things too closely because of, of ethnicity, right? Um, there's this uh, nice book by Carlo Ginsberg called Wooden Eyes. And he talks about uh, being Jewish, but raised, being raised Catholic and what this idea of distance does to his uh, scholarship and uh, in, uh, ideas of intellectual history, right? So uh, this idea of distance making the object of study clearer, right? Um, that um, for the Chinese, the straight Chinese don't have to be defined because it's already like, oh, you are Chinese, right? So they are what, you are one of us, you just left. But maybe the British took more efforts to uh, do so. Uh, I would also mention that uh, G.D. Harris' uh, textbook of documentary Chinese was uh, recently republished, uh, but the editors were uh, very nice about colonialism, right? They say, oh, this is great. Uh, we love Pickering. We love G.D. Harris as an example um, of, of collecting the sources and preserving it for us to study, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm proposing maybe distance, right, uh, using Carlo Ginsburg. Uh, when analyzing what is supposedly your own culture, right? Uh, but then I use the word supposedly because uh, we are in a different time and, time and space uh, right now. Um, okay, so maybe some comparisons. Why uh, Borneo and Patani? Uh, we have looked at uh, business colonial uh, and Qing viewpoints on the Chinese questions. Uh, and uh, the kinds of legal mechanisms to define customs that uh, justify extraction. So where does this leave us, right? Um, so here's a map of the Strait Settlements, right? The very easy narrative about colonization. Uh, uh, we have the British sphere of influence uh, connecting, uh, spreading widely. But if you zoom out and, and notice, uh, the British sphere of influence uh, applies to also uh, uh, parts of Thailand and uh, even states it on the map, you see, as well as, as, as this part in pink, right? Uh, but with different elements. So my idea is that to use uh, Patani as well as Sarawak to deconstruct national boundaries, right? So uh, geography, we, see, we know that Sarawak is a different landmass. Uh, Patani shares a border with Malaysia. Uh, there is also the idea that uh, becoming a minority is different in these uh, places, right? In Patani, you have Malay Muslims who live under Bangkok rule, and uh, the, the Thai monarch also uses Chinese industrialists to uh, make Malays minorities, right? And then in Sarawak, you have intermarriage between Chinese and indigenous Dayaks, and uh, they became, the mining communities became more integrated uh, un under the, the Raja rule, right? So these are quite uh, different uh, histories of colonization happening. And, and maybe it's, it's nice to bring out the picture of uh, land laws and, and, and customs, even though maybe Sarawak uh, adapted or used a lot of the land laws that started in uh, Malaya in the 20th uh, century. Okay, I, I don't think much to talk about the ruling ruler from Sumatra, uh, but I picked up paragraphs about the mining code and how you know the British tried to figure out land customs, but then uh, other people were doing other things by that, themselves. Okay, and then there's this figure of uh, the Malay Pawang. So Pawang is shaman in Malay, uh, but Terence uh, Sevier calls it a uh, miracle worker. Uh, why, why are shamans uh, who help Chinese miners find tin, tin from the ground, why are they called miracle workers? Uh, because uh, Pawang is also an agent of capitalism, right? They help, uh, but also they entrench miners in work. Uh, so uh, they help them find work, but also keep them in work using uh, spiritual practices that help to locate tin. Right? So they perform many tasks up and down the commodity uh, chain. And so this is uh, also another idea that uh, the Chinese miners worked together with the Pawang and this gave them hope. Uh, okay, this is my last slide. Uh, the purpose of this slide, I can't find a quote about 
uh, mining. So uh, here are some examples from other extractive industries. Right, uh, Penang, uh, Hokkien, uh, you know, the word for rubber plantation synthesizes uh, uh, the words from Thai uh, as well as uh, Hokkien, uh, right, for forests. Uh, so in, in literary history, I think uh, critics use this as an example of local color, right? This is, wow, this is a way of writing that reflects uh, creolization happening between different ethnicities. Yeah, but, you know, I, I would like to quote myself, you know, who doesn't, uh, with this idea of uh, applying linguistic histories for literary history, right? If we flip it, uh, the other way around, uh, rather than say that uh, these words, you know, the vocabulary, like this, this word, reflects uh, creolization, maybe it can be the engine of creolization, but it produces uh, certain linguistic mixings that have implications, right? You think about uh, maybe the, the book Words in Motion by Carol Glow, Lydia Liu, and Anna Singh, right? They write about just tracking one word and how that evolves across a, a span of time. All right, so um, I'm, I'm very happy to hear your uh, feedback and suggestions for my uh, project. I'll just leave this screen uh, here uh, uh, so that you know what I talked about for the last uh, 40 minutes. So thank you so much for uh, uh, listening. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Nicholas, for the wonderful talk. Um, as I said, we now have some time uh, for questions and answers. So um, if you're in the audience, please just uh, raise your hand and uh, then you can uh, ask um, Dr. Wong any uh, question you'd like about his talk. And um, if you are in the audience, then please uh, submit your question uh, through the Q&A button uh, in Zoom, and then I can uh, read them out um, and uh, Dr. Wong can, can answer. So uh, do we... Um, do we have any questions? Maybe in the room? Or... Yes, please. Yeah, so they talked about how these miners uh, came from uh, uh, Cornwall, right? Uh, and that rings bells to me because if you're talking about uh, the application or the need to define a personal law when you're talking about tin mining in Malay, right? Cornwall has a massive body of customary law around the mining of tin, right? The Cornish miners had their own parliament into the 18th century. And in fact, the customary law extends into the 19th century and ironically is getting abolished uh, around the time that these mining codes. So I guess this is my long-winded way of saying, of asking, and the, the question might be no, does the Cornwall connection matter when it comes to shaping these customary practices? Um, is, does that come into play at all, or is it just a historical accident? Mm, to look more closely at it, but um, the uh, the mining engineers coming from Cornwall were the dif were different from the people who wrote about customary law uh, from Malaya, right? So I don't think there's some overlap, right? Um, that they were not the Cornwall uh, practitioners were not doing uh, research; they were just coming to Malaya for their jobs. So, uh, but I, I think that's a very interesting historical perspective that I, I would really uh, like to pursue because uh, I think this adds another dimension to the transnational circulation of ideas. Right? Uh, what is custom? And I'm I'm sure uh, the uh, very historic uh, rise and decline of Cornish mining is is also one. Uh, part of the, the story. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, maybe I could uh, come in with, the, I think I have a comment and a question. Um, um, my question is kind of whether you could elaborate a bit more about the kind of, this kind of wandering, I guess, of, of textbook materials, because the, I mean, the hair textbook, you showed both of them, but I was particularly interested in the first one on documentary Chinese said that it had, it took excerpts from the Thomas Wade and uh, Peter Heard books who are uh, I think quite well, uh, which are quite well known, I think. Um, but I guess what my question gets at is, of course, the earliest book of those, Thomas Wade's book, was a, you know, it's called Documentary Chinese. I think, I mean, that's all how, how I always understood it, because it it basically tells the, he was a, you know, British consul in Shanghai, and basically trying to explain to people, how do you read, you know, edicts and other Chinese official documents? 
And if if you then kind of say that that's transferred to Hasbrook, I mean, you could almost say that you know they're trying to use Chinese official knowledge to rule the Chinese in um, you know in uh, um, uh, in the Nanya. Um, and uh, I wonder whether you could elaborate a bit more about that. And I think the second point, just to observe, is that um, I think you can you could trace this even further because both Wade and he had later become. Uh, I mean, Wade becomes the first professor of Chinese in Cambridge, and he had in first professor of Chinese at Columbia. And so kind of, uh, I guess that knowledge travels, you know, it might have traveled to the, um, or it certainly, as you showed, uh, traveled to um, uh, to the Strait Settlement and so on, but it also traveled to, travel sort of back to the West uh, in that sense, uh, in that sense as well. Yeah, but I'd just be interested in what, um, what you might have to comment. Right, great. Um, I would say that, um... So here, here is uh, here is what GT has said that he uh, borrowed the concept and the format of the textbook from uh, uh, Thomas Wade himself, right? Um, you know, people who work for the Imperial Chinese Maritime Customs they need to know uh, what diplomatic correspondences of business Chinese look like. Uh, when I look at the uh, Straits or, or, or Straits Settlements version. So the, the textbook by GT here, I think it's quite different. If you see the uh, table of contents, um, it is all drawn from uh, late, later material uh, pertaining to, uh, not to China, but to uh, Penang, Malacca, as well as Singapore. So uh, there are a lot of material that, that is uh, already excised, uh, but the format remains uh, the same, right? So uh, uh, or maybe I, I, sh I could have made that clearer, right? It, it is... Uh, an effort to uh, promote uh, a local understanding of, of the, the people they were governing. And uh, I don't think GT Hair got so much financial uh, support for his, his project as, as they would uh, in Shanghai on the China seaboard, right? Because this is not really that important, right? It was just being uh, set up, all right? Uh, and um, so I, I was curious that uh, the Hokkien vernacular is, is maybe goes back to GT Hare's time as uh, uh, studying in China and also uh, uh, working there. And he really mastered certain uh, Changzhou or Fujian uh, dialects. And maybe the, the question to ask is, does that uh, uh, sort of uh, version of Hokkien remain the same in the Hokkien vernacular or did he modify it to for local uh, consumption or local needs, right? So uh, what is this vernacular here? Right. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any any questions here? Rondo, maybe. Uh, hi, Doug Wong. Thank you for uh, this wonderful talk. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, could you uh, uh, describe more uh, the, the the group of Chinese in your research? Uh, I, I guess that's the, the, the mining workers, right? So uh, what are the relationship between this group of Chinese to uh, the broader group of Chinese in Southeast Asia? I, I would assume there are there, there are already uh, many like merchants, uh, maybe other migrant Chinese migrants in Southeast Asia as well at that time. So yeah. Right. Uh, great. So you picked up that. Uh, my focus is on maybe uh, labor, Chinese labor, and uh, the, the British attempts to protect, in their words, uh, their contracts uh, before they are shipped off to uh, uh, plantations and mines in Indonesia or elsewhere, right? So uh, the, being the, the transit depot, like if, when my, uh, miners or workers come to the straight settlements, uh, I think they had the responsibility to uh, uh, make sure it was not seen as uh, uh, that exploitative, right? So they provided certain mechanisms for uh, migration and, and, and movement of labor. Uh, so it is interesting that uh, you mentioned merchants and uh, businessmen, right? Uh, where, where does this come in in this picture? Uh, so the Qing uh, consulate in Singapore was set up ostensibly to protect Chinese labor, but it was also very interested in Chinese business interests, right? So I think that was, uh, uh, they were trying to do uh, two things at, at one, right? There was uh, the opium tax farming uh, uh, and, and how uh, taxation was, uh, was part of the, the issue as well. 
Um, but for me, I think as, as uh, someone who is interested in literary history, I'm interested in how uh, publics are being formed, right? Through a, a legal uh, claim uh, being made uh, by the British to take care of Chinese, or is it the Qing Chinese who try to come in quite late in the picture and say, we can also take care of our, our own people. Uh, but you see Huang Sunxian writing poems uh, petitioning the government back home to change a certain law so that the, uh, the genres, the written genres are uh, quite different, but they have the same effect, I think, uh, over Chinese labor. Um, we've got a few questions and comments online, so I want to not neglect them. Uh, our first question is, uh, or says, um, hi, Nicholas, thank you for your presentation. Um, you have mentioned that compared to the Hokkien uh, Guofang uh, the modern Hokkien is closer to the as a textbook, um, which period of spoken uh, Hokkien do you refer? Are you referring to? Um, could you elaborate more? Right. So this <clears throat> Hokkien vernacular, I think, approximates Penang Hokkien of the early twentieth century. Uh, if you if you see a, a certain genealogy there. Um, you know, there are different versions of Hokkien spoken everywhere, right? Uh, uh, versus uh, the ones in mainland or the ones in Malacca or elsewhere. But uh, I, I think I would just say it's the 20th century. Uh, maybe now there are certain uh, syntax and uh, uh, words are still being used that, that you can see from this uh, textbook also. Oh, thank you. Um, and I think you use the poem of Huang Junxian to illustrate that there is this Cantonese thing there. But frankly, I do not see very clearly the Cantonese element in Huang Junxian's poem. And for the Guo Fang Ge, I, I think um, I read some of Wilt Edema's, um Guo Fang Ge's text, and he, he cites quite a few different Wolfanger and, and, and I don't think the this genre is limited to, to the Hokkien, Hokkien dialect. I think there are some Cantonese Wolfanger. So so um I don't know what I'm trying to ask, but but this um meeting of different dialects, Chinese dialects in this part of the world is very interesting. Do you see a very distinct you know, this genre, you, you can you can say, oh, this is Hokkien, and that is Cantonese, or actually you cannot do that. Hmm. Right. It's a very interesting question that uh, this does not, uh, it's not easy to answer because uh, it, it's the text gets passed down through written forms, right? There's no uh, maybe uh, transcription of how the sounds were. Uh, so I, I, I was just uh, speculating, like reading it in Cantonese based on Huang Junxian's uh, heritage from Guangdong. Uh, so you're absolutely correct that uh, Guofangke existed in many different forms uh, uh, in different dialects, even though they tell the same story, right? It, it can be uh, recited in, in uh, many different ways, uh, draws on different uh, performative uh, histories and uh, traditions. Uh, so maybe a multilingual way of studying uh, Kuo Fang Ke would be the approach, right? Uh, to uh, Do I study this as a reflection of uh, text, text, textual concerns as a, a literature? Uh, is this a reflection of orality, a certain remnants of how uh, uh, maybe people pass on their testimonies and oral histories, uh, and how does that link to the textual? Um, so uh, I, I, bring, I bring in Hokkien today because uh, there was GT Hess textbook, Hokkien Vernacular, and I thought this would be a nice way to also synthesize some of the ideas uh, uh, that have uh, come up again and again, right? Uh, when we talk about Hokkien, right? Maybe we categorize them as okay, Hokkien minors, but they, they were also Cantonese minors and Hakka minors in different kinds of uh, commodities, right? Gold, it was not just tin, right? Uh, or uh, sugarcane, right? So 
uh, do I specify the ethnicities of, of the homelands of each uh, uh, of, of these laborers or just talk about Chinese as a general concept, right? It, it's something I'm, I'm still grappling with. Uh, so uh, 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 I, I hope certain parts of the words and uh, maybe linguistic etymologies would show me uh, the direction forward. They, I think they have, uh, I, I don't think they, they, they did it um, with their own dialects. I think they have some standards um, in writing classical poems. That, that, that poem doesn't, seems to me to be particularly Cantonese. Um, it, but it's a very, it's, it's written in very stylish classical Chinese, I would say, more than Cantonese. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, but other than this poem, do you have other genre that, um, that you, you think is, uh, demonstrate the Cantonese presence in this part of the world? Yeah, you have uh, forms like the Zhu Zi Zi, mm. uh, right? That uh, also have a certain kind of a classical way of forming the poem. Uh, they deal with uh, quite Su topics also, sometimes like regions, like uh, prostitution, opium smoking in Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, so these are the forms that uh, elite intellectuals would pick up and use to cater to, to writing about Malaysia and Singapore. Right, so I, I think you, uh, there are certain books that you can read, Zhu uh, Zi collection of, of these uh, poems, uh, and they also try to track it back to uh, where they came from in China. Yeah, so, I mean, we have a, on that, we have a comment um, from um, our colleague Elizabeth Sin, which uh, I'd like to uh, read out. It's, so she says, um, Learning the languages, including dialects uh, and customs, is a problem widely experienced and dealt with by European missionaries and administrators uh, around China and Southeast Asia, at least since the early 19th century. So you could put your work in that context and find a lot of research uh, materials. Um, the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, for example, um, also produced a lot of uh, pedagogical uh, material. So I don't know whether you want to respond to that or... Uh, yes, absolutely. I, <laughs> um, incidentally, uh, because of the ban of language learning in China, that uh, missionaries went further to Southeast Asia to actually uh, uh, learn Chinese. And in the process of doing so, they managed to spread certain ideas in Southeast Asia. Uh, so, so I think it goes back to maybe uh, pre-Opium War days also. So. Uh, definitely, thank you, uh, Professor Sin, for that comment. I, I would, I would love to connect missionary as well as uh, uh, legal customs. I think it would be quite an interesting uh, discussion that, that's happening. Right, you have the religious aspect of codification and as well as uh, customary law becoming uh, textual material. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any, any more questions? In the audience here. Um. I mean, uh, there are a few more um, comments online, so I, um, I I can certainly read out um, one or two more of those. Um, so one question that comes from Chang Yi Chang uh, says, "Dr. Wong, good afternoon. May I ask? May I ask? Uh, do these texts in your research uh, document the image or identity of quote unquote Tokai? Um, if there are, uh, what would be its representation from the imperial point of view and in, in that period of time?" Um, I'm not sure. Toka is T O W K A Y. Mm -hmm. uh, Tauke, so Hitman or the boss. Uh, uh, yes, so I, uh, if you look at, let's say, uh, uh, the documentary Chinese textbook of uh, GT Hare, you would notice that maybe the Tauke were complaining about not getting paid or they, they want to sue some other person. So you, you would see a lot of the paper trail of these, this, uh, this discussion. Uh, but what I noticed for anti-colonial uh, you know, May 4th writers who, who came to Malaysia in the 30s onwards, they would uh, 
uh, the Tao Ke is a bad figure, right? It's a negative figure who exploits and is part of the uh, agent of cap capitalism who exploits our laborers, right? So that there's that uh, depiction in, in the literature. Uh, but here you see a, a different picture emerging of the Tao Ke, right? Uh, uh, being uh, uh, maybe sandwiched in between certain uh, interests, uh, not just business, but administrative, but also uh, maybe even linguistic. But yeah, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, any any other questions? Um, I guess I, sort of I, I have a uh, um, another question that is probably um, I'm not sure whether that really falls within kind of uh, you know what you are I mean at looking at it from sort of the literary perspective, but I I guess sort of from my perspective as an economic historian um, and looking at you know how kind of foreigners try to make sense of I mean if we sort of see this attempt writing these textbooks as a way of controlling Chinese labor and kind of trying to be able to do that as a colonial administrator. Um, I think that can sort of be compared to what foreigners in a place like Shanghai, for example, try to, you know, how they try to um, make sense of things like, you know, customary law and order to understand, you know, how do we do business with the Chinese and so on. Um, and in my experience, sort of from the documents that I've read, um, that never really works out. So the information asymmetry that is there um, is very much heavily in favor of the Chinese. And, you know, they have to, you know, the foreigners have to stick to employing compradors. Um, but even, you know, beyond that, it's always clear that, you know, the, you know, the, the understanding of, you know, a, a foreign banker or foreign merchant of the Chinese economy remains limited, even after, you know, I think we can see that even into the 1920s, 30s, when, you know, people have been there for a century or so, it still kind of, you know, doesn't work out. So, I'm wondering whether, you know, if you see this kind of as a way of, I guess, producing knowledge that can, you know, for foreigners about, in this case, you know, Chinese labor, and whether you, in the end, see that, is it effective? Is it, is it, is it actually successful in their kind of, I mean, can we say that uh, in this, because this is, of course, a different context from a place like Shanghai, which is, I guess, we want to, we use the word semi-colonial. This is a different context. So I wonder whether you think these endeavors in the end are, you know, successful in a way. Um, I know this is yeah. maybe, a different question than you know what you're like getting at but uh, but i would still be sort of interested in that hmm. yeah i i don't know it's a very interesting question i haven't uh, found much uh, of the history of the reception of, of these textbooks uh, i i know that this uh documentary chinese or hockey and vernacular they exist as just one small part of many versions of uh, dictionaries, lexicographic projects to understand Chinese or learn Chinese. And so which one is the effective, the most effective textbook, right? Um, uh, I think this uh, instance is very interesting because it tries to approach the question of the Chinese question from so many perspectives, right? Uh, not just uh, diplomacy, uh, business, uh, labor uh, from different genres, uh, but, but these, you know, before they became textbook material, it existed as living forms that were being circulated, right? It was a proclamation to the emperor that got excised and studied as a textbook material. So they had some diplomatic impact uh, in, in, uh, outside of, of that. But in terms of the colonial uh, uh, efficacy, I, I, I do not know. Uh, the answer is that yes, uh, there was colonization that expanded right, in Malaya, but was it because of this textbook? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time, so unless there is a final question here in the audience, um, I think what remains for me to do is uh, thank you very much, Nicholas, for taking the time uh, to give us a talk and for um, um, for answering all our questions uh, patiently. And also thank you to all of you, both online and in person, that came to uh, came to the lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>